Hello, hello. Welcome to a brand new episode of the SaaS Prince podcast, the podcast for content marketers in SaaS. And I'm your host, Yag. In today's episode, we are going to discuss the various alignment issues that lead to making content marketing ineffective and not delivering the expected results. To discuss that, today I'm going to be talking to my longtime friend, a brother, an eternal supporter, Nemanja Zivkovic. Nemanja is the founder and strategist at Funky Marketing, a new age demand gen agency for B2B organizations based out of Serbia. He is also the co-founder of NS Business Talks, where he is building a strong community through professional business networking. He also mentors startups and is an active member at the Founder Institute. Without stealing any more of his thunder, hey ho, let's go. Hey Nemanja, super, super, super happy to have you here. How are you doing today? Hey Jack, how are you, brother? I'm good. The kicking off uh, with this recording, like a uh, challenging week. You mentioned the Founder Institute. Like tomorrow is the the kickoff of, of the uh, you know this autumn cohort, a- and a lot of things generally going on. And I'm happy to to jump a- and talk about these specific topics because because uh, I found out that like this is the topic that we often chat in non-formal environment right and uh, not that often we get into the details and and talk about the things and i was listening to your podcast and i see a lot of people that you know talk about about content about execution or how does it go but i don't see that many companies actually executing it so uh the, the topic that we aligned to talk about i think it's it's a great one and i can't wait to to get into it No, absolutely. I'm super excited. One of the key reasons is that, you know, you are a fellow agency owner. At the same time, you see a lot of B2B companies that you work with. So I'm absolutely interested in hearing the real time things that you come across on a daily basis. So let's start with this. You know, on one side, a lot of people, even outside of the marketing department, they tend to feel like they know marketing. Of course, it's one curse of the function that we work in. And in fact, content marketing is one of those functions where everyone has an opinion. And yet, content marketing is a lot complicated than what it seems at the outside. So in your experience, what do you think actually makes it complex? Why is that, you know, companies often underestimate what it takes? Yeah, that that's a great question. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, I'm not the agency owner anymore. I'm now running, we are more of like consultancy firm. So so I have yeah. the experience of, of uh, you know, from another point, from actually being the one inside the company as a factual CMO who is actually hiring agencies, right? right. So, uh, so when I think about content marketing, like it's same as marketing, right? When we think about marketing, we, uh, we say that it's equal to marketing. And about marketing, everybody thinks that they know things, right? Uh, everybody thinks that they know what marketing is. Everybody thinks that they know what great marketing is. Even as we marketers, often when we see a, a post, a visual, a campaign, we say, ah, that's shit or that's great, but without actually knowing if it brings results or no, right? So we also fell into that trap of actually commenting thing without knowing if they are actually successful. And and it's so easy. We are living in a world, especially the, now that the younger generations, when they uh, grew up with the internet, with the market, right? Is the, I think social media is the current state of the internet. Now we're slowly moving into web three and whatever it is, but it is like we are spending more time on social that we are uh, spending doing our work. Uh, we are using social for also for sharing our personal information, sharing with friends. Everything is our is in our phone and it comes naturally to us. So, uh, Actually, what what you said is one of the things that I recognize in a, in the younger people when when I hire them when they come to work with me. Usually, you know, they think that they know everything and they think that they uh, know how things work. the The point here is they grew up with the social and they are naturally good at it. They make results, but they don't know to break it down. How did they get to the results? Right, they don't know why they did specific things, so they cannot replicate. It. And they need somebody who is, you know, uh, who knows the customers, who knows the strategy, who has been there to kind of 
show them like, look, let's reverse engineering and see how did you get there. When you explain it to them, then it's easier for them to replicate it. And uh, I think that's that's something that goes along uh, all the way. I can go into more details, but I think we'll we'll gonna go step by step through that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. I definitely, you know, I also come from the same place where I've been more of an executioner. And then, you know, slowly when you look back, sometimes you know that you instinctively you do certain things and you're not able to articulate a step by step, which I think is a great perspective to look at so that it can be a blueprint that you can consistently replicate going forward. But let's also talk a little bit about the other side, you know, where um, the, the underestimating part, because you know, if you don't know what are the components of certain things and, uh, you know, you cannot like say, if I have to do a product launch about one month down the line, you have to have a sheet at least to say that, hey, these are the 20 things that I need to have ready by this day for which I have to work on these, these things. And you need to have a set of plans towards that. And that I think is often underestimated because you think, hey, let's do a video. Let's do a blog post. That's not how it works, right? Yeah, th- definitely not how it works, but it seems like People think that that is how it works, right? When I, when I come into the companies, usually what I see from the old times is that, you know, and I think you and I talk about it, that on the podcast in the past, it is, you know, that companies have a content, which is basically blogs, right? It's uh, convenient for them. They are targeting Google uh, and they don't need to talk with anybody. Right, so it's convenient. We can just write it from our own perspective. But now with AI, with things changing, we need more resources, we need more non-obvious content, and then it becomes harder, right? And uh, even that content that they created, it might be good from, from for Google. It's not good for uh, distribution on the social. A- and that's what makes it, uh, you know, complex. And that's what makes it a little complicated to execute because when we talk about execution, a lot of things are manual. Right, you need to actually go and do the things. If it's, you know, uh, other, okay, if we are talking about LinkedIn, about Twitter, you already know what. To do. But if we talk about Reddit, we we talk about Facebook communities. It's much harder because you need to go out there, be the part of the community, become the part of the community, and actually figure out how they are sharing content. So you don't get banned from that community, right? You need to get to know your customers. A lot better than uh, you know that a lot of companies uh, know them, and and I think those are the things that that they go. Also, there is one more thing: is they look at. Uh, I wouldn't say they are competitors, but then the companies they are north star for them, right? And usually those are the companies already established, working for for ten plus years, uh, and they look at them and they see, oh, this is what they are doing. But they don't, uh, you know, understand that those companies were doing different things when they were smaller and, and on their level. So uh, a lot of a lot of nuances here to think about, and a lot of room to make mistakes. I would say like that. You know, I'm loving this because based on what you said, I, it feels like we can go in ten different tangents because so many different threads that you leave. One is you know copying what a big company is doing. For example, of course, you know. Everybody at some point has tried to copy what HubSpot does when it comes to content marketing, but you don't realize that what they were then, what they are now is very, very different. And uh, I love the part where you also brought up this thing about um, using generative AI to create content. And that's one thing that I would love to slightly double click on. For example, you know, a lot of people tend to think that given that we have access to generative AI, it's time that we have to create more and more content. And then there is also the other side where there are people who are absolutely not consistent when it comes to creating content. So let's let's talk about these two perspectives. Is it about creating more content? Of course, let's let's assume that it's quality content that is created and not just you know pumping something based on chat GPT. But is it about creating more content or is it more about consistency or is it about any particular format? What do you see working these days? Yeah, uh, I mean, it all depends what are your goals. Right, I can look at funky marketing and say look, we, we chosen to have a, a specific amount of uh, of content on the website for one reason, not to get the clients from Google, but to actually when when I talk with customers, potential clients, I can just uh, direct them to the article. I don't need to explain to send them a lot of documents, those kind of things. Uh, and luckily, one of or two of those rank well. So basically, when somebody searches. Uh, B2B strategies for startups, they, they come to funky market, right? Which is exactly what we aim for. 
Uh, on the other hand, I'll give you an example of uh, of a Turkish startups that a startup that I was working with called User Guiding. Basically, they had this uh, this thing they didn't know for which category they should rank because uh, basically it uh, it's onboarding tool, uh, no code tool. It can be used as a project management, a lot of things, and basically they didn't know in which direction to go. So uh, luckily. Uh, Product team was talking to the customers. Customer support uh, team was also talking to the customers. They have those calls recorded. When we go through the calls, we figure out that they can go in six different directions, right? That there's no uh, one or two. So what we did, basically figure out, okay, we need to build a media uh, company in a way not going, you know, entertainment and, and video, but going full on written content. Because there's already demand on Google, and we need to utilize that demand. So basically, uh, we jumped in as as an agency uh, and work with with their team to kind of come up. It was at one moment it was twenty articles per month. All of those articles from uh, two thousand five hundred words to uh, and more, but with specific topics that and we covered each keyword step by step. You know to go through it. And the thing is, we got the insights from them. We used AI in in one way to uh, to get more insights, and then basically we we needed to go through all of the content to check out what's real, what's not, depending on the you know AI. And also on the other hand, we had another check from them to see if articles are good. And in time, they were able to produce a lot. Then in time, we helped them also create a system to bring on board their own people. And now they have their own team. And if you go and, and check like project management or uh, user onboarding, uh, those kind of things, you will see user guiding, uh, I think, in the first five results on Google. At least that, that, that's what it, what it was last time I checked. So, uh, you know, we figure out, we found uh, the insights where we need to go, and then we executed Fast on it, they didn't have people inside the company, so they hired an agency to help them go through those things. And it helped them and it helped a lot uh, to us as well. And it was like, you know you know how was my team. It was uh, like three of us at the time working on that. And it was one person from, actually two from, from the company side. One is like uh, overviewing the whole content thing and the other one was an analytical guy giving us the insights. So uh, it's not a lot of people uh, and it's just like a pure execution when you know what, what the goal is. So all depends, to get back to your, to your initial question, all depends on what you want to achieve. Do you have already the demand that you want to utilize? Are you writing the articles maybe to distribute them on social or, uh, you know, maybe you want to have a, a research that will be, you know, once in six months that you do it with your with your partners and then basically that that piece of content uh, lifts you up yeah no that makes a lot of sense of course you know user guiding i've uh, consistently seen them over the last several months uh popping up on several topics related to the gtm side of the house especially you know the support and onboarding side and uh the interesting part is while you made it very clear about the thing where the more content you publish of course it's going to be helpful because the more you surface on searches and the more you can generate demand but let's let's also dive a little bit about the the consistency aspect let's let's talk about uh you know why at all is there inconsistency in creation is it because of um, lack of having a clear clear strategy is it because of resource is it because of not having the right expectations I mean, of course, uh, all of these aspects do come in, but what do you think is that one pinpoint that you generally initially try to fix whenever you go into an organization? Yeah, usually, you know, there there are two things. Uh, one is uh, definitely inconsistency, and one is definitely related to that. It's who you have inside your team, right? Uh, usually, companies don't have the right person to execute execute the things. Usually when I come into the companies and they say, hey, hey we have a small uh, marketing team, right? Most of the times those are people like, um, I don't know, creative director uh, or more suited for that. So they can come up with, uh, you know, with creative videos, but that's it. You know, uh, 
or it might be somebody who who does you know performance marketing so somebody who does advertising those kind of things not often there do i come into the company and and see you know how, aha there's a amazing writer that knows how to you know instruct the insights from the customers and uh, basically make the content out of it usually that doesn't happen if it's if it is a, a writer inside the company usually it's the one that was so we are talking about SaaS. Usually, it's the one that was working in, uh, I don't know, in tourism or B two C or those kind of things. And when I give them a task, they say, "Okay, I'm a strategist. I know how to do this. I will, I will perform." Usually, you know, I need to follow up after three weeks and say what happened. And and uh, two or two three times, I got the the response. I need three months to get into that. Because, you know, SaaS is a lot of, uh, it's specific and, and it's, you know, um, you need to know the expressions. You need to understand how the things go inside the companies, how the cust- the, cu- the way customers buy has changed. Also talking um, about one of the big uh, media publishers, I got the answer when we talk about the content. They hired us to, to write some of the pieces for them. They told me, you know, like, you are the 20th. Second on the 23rd, the agency owner that I'm talking with, and you are the first one that seems like they understand what I'm talking about. You know, so it, it happens a lot because those people, when you look at the blogs that people write for, for tourism, for those kind of things, those are like simple 500 words blog, and they just tend to, uh, to write as many of them as possible. And thinking that they're going to rank. Basically, they don't, but they are paid, so they need to do something. Right, and that's a completely different thing. And then when it comes to inconsistency, it it roots back to to some uh, thing that you know we're going to talk about definitely a lot more in the uh, in the continuation of the of the podcast. But it's you know uh, how the leadership looks at the content. Is that the mean to get to the customers, to get to the more revenue, to get to the more profit, whatever it is? Or it is just something that, you know, everybody else has content we hear that we need to do this. So let's go ahead and do it. And from the start, there are those two things. I like to say always marketers sounds like they're crucified because one side is brand, another is performance or demand. And basically, you know, when you look at that, the, the, the marketer inside the company needs to be the one who knows how to deal with these things. Right, because there's a pressure to bring lo- to to build long term or to get performance right away, but you need both. And there's a pressure for performance. There's a pressure from the CEO, from the investor. Okay, if the, if it's the founder, maybe he realized the the you know the the need of building a brand in time. But still, you know, you need to figure out like I'm gonna hire agency to uh, to help me with performance or or with brand stuff, right? And then it's kind of difficult, especially if you have, you've worked on a limited budget and if you go and do things. And usually I like to say, you know, your first uh, marketer in the team should be somebody who uh, understand the product, understand that side and can execute on his own, on her own as well. You know that you've been uh, in that position uh, a lot of times in your career. And I think you are the, the right definition for, for that for that person. No, I, I'm smiling because, you know, I 100% resonate with almost everything that you're saying here. And uh, especially when you gave that example of somebody saying that they need three months in a typical SaaS startup environment, you know, if you go and say that to a CEO, you're going to, you're asking to be fired, right? So it's it's like the general conversation in um, B2B SaaS startups is usually this, right? So if you can get something done in a quarter, let's do it in a month. If you can do this in a month, let's do it in a week. Uh, And, uh, you know, if we can do it in a week, we can try to do it in days. And in that kind of an environment, if you're saying that, hey, this is going to take this time and I have only an understanding of these things and absolutely right. In the initial days, you have to have a broad understanding. Of course, you have your specialization, but if you don't know how the dots are connected, then, you know, you are not going to be able to report to the CEO because for CEO, you have to have things that, the KPIs that matter to them to be able to actually, you know, show that how things are moving forward. 
Right. So, Nemanja, at this point, I, I have a interesting sponsored question by OutFunnel. So, I'm going to ask you that. What are the biggest challenges that you see right now when it comes to uniting the data from sales and marketing so that you know what to do next? Uh, there are two things. First thing first, and then the second one. So it's the mindset. Always is the mindset that for, you need to fix first. So so they are all aligned on the same thing, right? It starts from the leadership, then marketing, then sales. Could they work on the same thing, converting the same uh, the the same uh, customers? So it's not like you are going after one, we are going after the other one, and which is usually what happens because they work in silos. They they don't talk to each other. So that's one thing. And how do we align them? We need to set up the right metrics. So that's the second one. We need to set up the right metrics to be able to actually get the results that we want, right? Usually it's, uh, I think everything that, that's bad over there, it's how do we define MQLs. MQLs are not uh, per se bad, but the way we define them, it's usually is. So, and that causing a lot of stress inside the companies and everybody look at the other side as like, what you are, what are you doing? You're not giving me the right insights. The uh, sales marketing sales said you are coming up with uh, with the leads that are shitty. They don't want to buy with, uh, from us. Then customer support says people are unsatisfied with the way uh, you know our buyer journey go because they have a lot of uh, a lot of things that that are coming over there which is not okay. Then you have like accounts that are closing. They are here just to close. Then you have SDRs who are here to you know just uh, schedule a call. That that's their metric. So they go and they schedule the calls. They don't care the quality of that. So a, a lot of things uh, to think about when you're coming up with the right metrics and what do we actually need to measure. But it all starts from the mindset. If the mindset is the right, we will choose the right metrics. And, uh, you know, in the lead up to this recording today, one of the things that we were conversing on chat the other day, you know, it also reminded me where you said that, hey, I'm looking at things over the last six months or so. Still, people are talking about the same set of things that they used to talk in 2020. Uh, And, uh, you know, things have not changed at all. I mean, I can understand that the basics are not changing, but even the adaptation, even post COVID, still it remains the same and people are operating in the way that they used to in the past which is very, very strange. Yeah, to, to, to tell you one thing, I was thinking about it last night. I was playing basketball and then I check out the LinkedIn and the guy added a comment to my post and said, you know, I agree with everything in this post, but, you know, just for your record, I still don't uh, agree with you that we can create demand, right, from that perspective. <laughs> and I was looking at that and I was thinking, look, like the only thing that that came uh, became a topic so like demand creation, uh, converting the demand, uh, closing the demand is because for me, it's much simpler than coming up with awareness, with brand, then with demand, then with performance marketing. There are a lot of different stuff. You are in the market or you are outside of the market. And that depends on how you are going to talk about it and how you go through it. But, uh, yeah. and, and we seem to talk about these things like MQLs, then demand and those things. But most companies need to fix the foundation, right? Yeah. The foundation, which most companies, they don't know what four pieces of marketing are. They don't know the basics of sales. They don't know these basic things. And usually when we are now in, in this complex environment, uh, basic, especially in SaaS, the solution to the complex problem is always fixing the foundation. No, I know of companies that have existed for the last seven, eight or even 10 years and still they don't know, um, you know, what pieces of their marketing funnel is actually contributing to revenue, you know, which is actually bringing in the pipeline. And uh, if you don't know that, of course, you don't know where to invest and where to double down on. Absolutely. I'm 100% with you. Right. Let's let's talk about, uh, you know, being competitive with content. Um, While well, everyone wants to create uh, more demand, like you just mentioned, and everybody wants to improve their conversion, what does it really mean to be competitive with your content? Is it about more content? Is it about being active on social media like LinkedIn? Or is it about trying to understand, do I have a different point of view? What does it really mean to be competitive? To be competitive, that's, that's kind of interesting. I, I like this saying uh, that... Uh, you know, when you when you choose the category where you're going to go, or it can be a subcategory, whatever it is, uh, and you narrow the target group. And, and I like to say, uh, you know, if it's small enough, 
that you can uh, conquer that target group in 18 months. So th that's how I like to look at it. If you can be the number one, if in 18 months with your content, with your marketing efforts, whatever it is you do, it means not that you are competitive, that's what you do. And, uh, and basically this should be the starting point. From that you develop and you go wider, but make it small enough so you know those people, you know who they are and you how to deliver them results that they want to, uh, to get, to be able to solve their problems. And when you do it like this, like a small group can mean a lot because it's cohesive and they talk with each other. And, you know, if you deliver results, it will spark the world of mouth, which is basically what you are going after. If you're creating content, it's the most powerful one. And when you do that, then you go wide. But also you cannot do that if you don't have like a way to differentiate, if you don't have a different point of view, because basically if you're already coming up with a product, it, me it should mean that you see something that other people in your environment, in space, don't see. And usually as a founder, as a, even as a marketer, strategist, you're pissed off because other people don't see it. And now your task is through the content, through your marketing efforts, to kind of uh, draw the path for them to see those things and to go and execute that. Uh, why? Because they need to see what's for me in it. Right, because it needs to start from them. Why do exactly this company needs to do these specific things or buy this specific product? So that's usually usually how it goes, and that's why I say start with a smaller target group, go and try to execute that in eighteen months and become the number one. Actually, when I say number one, I mean uh, go ahead and have thirty percent of of the market in that target group. That in itself is is a big thing. And, you know, it makes me wonder as I hear you more and more in this topic, it, it makes me wonder, are these insights becoming more uh, common to you or is it becoming second nature to you because you have probably in the last one year uh, become more active conducting events in real life, you know, in person. Has this contributed to this thought process? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm talking about uh, the conferences and uh, uh, meetups that you're conducting these days. Is these in-person conversations, are they contributing to your this kind of a thought process to get the real-time insight that, hey, if I need to, if I can just make sure that this kind of an audience in this zone, in this category, if I can make sure that they know me and they understand my point of view, that is my first target. So because a lot of times when you're working remote and you're doing this online, you're largely depending on one, either you're listening to conversations of, uh, you know, customer success and sales and making those uh, inferences, or you're doing your typical SEO research and some third party research or part participating in, say, groups like your Bravado or Pavilion and things like that. But in-person events give you a whole different dimension because the conversation is more qualitative. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, there are couple of things when you are a member of the community the active member of the community especially if you are the owner right that's that's another another layer to it you need to be active in that community because they look up to you as as you know as the subject matter expert right and when you are there every day you get a feedback on every you know in every possible place when i say that i mean like i was sitting in a cafe uh, two weeks ago and uh, the lady was walking through and said are you Nemanja I'm, I'm a member of the funky marketing uh you know actually is business talks now uh community and I'm looking at your content on LinkedIn every day and like thank you thank you for everything that you're doing if I can help anyway go ahead when I, when it's time for me to hire you I would do that and uh I don't mean only that uh, and I mean like you get the insights from from people, uh, you know, because we have this WhatsApp group where we also have offline events. So when we talk with people, we seems like it's you know enough basic for everybody inside that community. But what we found out when we actually talk one on ones with people, we found out that they are scared of networking, so they don't know how to network. They don't know the the foundation, the basic, because nobody ever taught them. And our content seems uh, high level to them. Right. So, uh, and we needed to go back to the drawing board and figure out what we are doing with that. Cause our goal with the community was kind of to, to get in the center of the whole ecosystem, connects all the companies 
IT, non-IT, family companies, uh, like all the uh, all the business chambers and everything else that that is there uh, to help the whole ecosystem kind of skip a few steps in their development because there are not there aren't enough people that have made it in that way. They are sharing. So, uh, and when we look at that, it's exactly what people told us. We need the foundation. We need the basic to be able to skip a few steps. And then, okay, if when we figure out that out, then you bring experts from, from abroad. You bring somebody else to come in and kind of help us, you know, have a different point of view or whatever it is. But let us figure out the basics first. And, and and what I what I like to uh, to tie kind of to that we talk about metrics. Uh, one of the metrics that, that I like, especially regarding to that, is uh, you know kind of creating a trophy room inside the company. Okay, if it's a community, everybody talks publicly over there, so you can see it. But if it's you know uh, if it's a company, and uh, you know you you create content, you distribute it all around the place. Uh, you have a lot of people from company you know, actually uh, being a part of creating the pipeline, then uh, you need to create a trophy room when you will share all the things, all the insights that you get from different Slack communities, from uh, social media, but also from uh, from asking the question on the website, right, self-reported attribution, how did you hear about us and why do you want to work with us? So when you have that inside the company, it gets much easier for you to communicate the value of it. Right, because the the everybody in the company sees that, you know, you can go to the to the CEO or whoever it is that you are reporting to. It may be the CMO if you are head of content, and you can tell them, look, like this is actually working, and give them exact metrics that they want to see. But it comes on top of them already seeing what you share inside the Slack, and not only you but other members of the team. Right, so it's basically you get everything in one place, and it's it's a proof that you need for the inside the company. So not only for the outside. You know, one key takeaway for me from this is um, again, um, it comes down to those first principles, wherein it's not always about going inside out as to what you have to say, but actually get things outside in so that you specifically understand that having that empathy to go back and. It's, it's not that hey, I have an audience to talk to, but it's about understanding that is everybody comfortable uh, or what is it they specifically want? What are the obstacles? This is why, you know, I, I keep uh, enjoying when I go back to those little jobs to be done perspective. And of course, uh, Bob Moesta is one of the geniuses out there on this specific topic. Uh, yeah, I absolutely love talking to him. And he, he stumps you off the guard, right? So when suddenly that conversation went into the path where he asked me, how did you go about buying that shoe? It, it gave me an entire different perspective right there in that moment. So yeah, that's that's one thing that I take away from this, right? Uh, let's let's finally talk a little bit about uh, the promotional side of content. You know, a lot of content is not just about how you create it, and uh, you spoke about this aspect of where you said uh, it's impo- important to go about building a media company. A lot of people say that, but very few people really understand what it means to do it, and. Um, for a lot of people, it typically means that um, taking your piece of content, be it like, you know, a podcast snippet or be it a blog post or even, you know, your zero click content and kind of spamming in in all possible channels that you know. And as you rightly said, it will only help you getting blocked by those communities. So what does promotion even mean in sense like? If you will give me a broad blueprint as to this is how one needs to think about promotion, that will be very, very helpful. Yeah, I, I like that. And you can spend with promotion as well. So we need to say that. But I, I think of, uh, you know, of promotion, uh, if if you go and look at it, like organic content should be something that it is over there as a continuation of what you do in a company. What's your role in the company is, right? Talk about specifically these things. Not everybody from the company you know, copy the post that it is on the on the company page, <laughs> right? Which usually what happens, or they reshare it even, not not even copy it. So uh, exactly. those things don't work. And uh, why would I follow a CEO which just copies the thing from the company page, right? I would follow the company page. You are just a bot. You are just somebody that is doing the you know automation of something 
and, and you know, it's probably it's not even the CEO that they're, they're posting that content. But uh, when we look at, you know, uh, from the start point that we made the organic work, right? So we see the engagement from the right people. We get messages from the right people. The right people are uh, scheduling the calls on the website or or get the, or getting demos or whatever it is our CTA, uh, and then basically you know that's a, a small group that we can address through organic content. If we don't get viral here and there, but no matter if we add the right people or engage with the right people, it's still we cannot be sure that those are the right companies that we are targeting. Right. So from that perspective, we need to go and uh, execute on the advertising and advertising. I look at it as just amplification of what we already doing organic, which means we make sure that our content is seen by the right people, by our ICP or by our target group. So if we say these 50 companies are the ones that we want to target, uh, we mentioned, you know, conquer, uh, get 30% of the, of the market in 18 months. So let's see, these are the 50 companies that are over there. That's, that's the 30%. What we want to do is we want to make sure that they are seeing everything that we post. They are seeing each piece of our content. So it's not only, you know, uh, let's gather their information and basically, you know, try to get them on the calls that they don't want to be to sell them something that they don't want to buy. So we want them to kind of look the whole overview of the things. So realize okay, there is a problem that we are having. So uh, realize why they don't solve this problem, you know, because we already work with those kind of companies and we can tell them, you know, you are not solving this problem because of lack of the budget, because of not enough resources in-house, because it's not, uh, you know, I don't know, it's the new CMO and it's not the priority yet or, or whatever it is. So we can, we can tell them exactly those things and those are actually the types of content that we are actually arming the account champion to kind of go and, and sell inside the company when they need to sell. Then we uh, obviously need to show them how does it look like if they actually uh, work with us, if they buy the product, right? If they implement it inside the company, how does that result look like for them? Not for everybody else, but for those 50 companies. Uh, also, maybe that's not enough, right? So then we need to also add a, a thing or two about the product. So why we are different from the others, why we are the right fit for them, right? That's, that's the part that we are uh, using as uh, demand conversion, right? When we already have companies in the space, maybe they are not the right fit for those 50 companies because then that's why we build the product for you guys, right? So we need to show them exactly why the product is for them. And then finally, we need to, uh, to show them, has anybody bought the product yet? Has, have they tried it? Is it okay? Is it giving those results that we are promising? So what are others thinking about it? So we have all those layers, uh, you know, distributed in the feed where, uh, you know, people from the company are actually consuming it, not only the decision makers, but also those people that will use the product. So then we have, we can impact, uh, you know, the decision making from above and from inside. And if we add to that uh, something that we uh, mention a lot these days is our influencers or evangelists in, in B2B, uh, people that those people trust. And if they appear also in, in our content, then basically we, we've done a lot. And the, the goal of the content is to help the people, no matter in which stage they are, just to get to the next stage. It's not to skip five steps and go to the website and convert because it won't happen. So we need to get we need to get them to the website when they are ready. So from that perspective, it's a little bit different. And uh, you know that's how I like to look at the advertising because if you go and look, I don't know if uh, people listening are consuming the content on LinkedIn every once in a, in a week. There's somebody saying PPC doesn't work anymore, right? Uh, what works are the, the branded keywords, right? And, and they are working because people know the company and they work even better when you actually are out there. Uh, as long as you create content, they work better. And, they, and you don't spend that much. Basically, you close the existing demand for you, you know, for your company. Uh, and, you know, some people may call that, uh, you know, 
not creating demand. Some may call it, you know, creating awareness, creating brand. But usually with that amplification uh, through the advertising, you can uh, appear that you have a brand even before you build a brand. It takes time to build a brand, right? So uh, it takes time. And I can give the example of what we did with, with Funky Marketing in the first year when we started the company, right? You, you, you know that basically we, we came up with the list Funky Marketing Top Voices. And we said inside the company, we said these 20 people are going to be on the list. Those are the people that we see, they are legit. And we want them to be the top voices for, uh, you know, for the people that are following us. So basically, we recorded a podcast with each, each one of you. Uh, and then uh, basically distributed that organically and through the advertising to the specific target group. And it gave us the content for the next six months to distribute. And we, we created, at the same time, we created relationship with those people uh, and uh, we involved them into the, you know, talk about funky marketing. And it looked like, hey, funky marketing is equal to Refine Labs. No, we are not. But it looks like that. We were in the same conversations. You remember that at the time. Even some, even some, of, some of those people like Nikos Larnic from, from the HTEC, Actually, he had a hashtag on, on his profile, Funky Marketing Top Voice. We didn't even remember to, to use the hashtag for that, right? So uh, it's actually easy to execute when you know what you want to do and what is the content for. No, I'm loving this because the, the as soon as I, I completed my thought and the question, I, I love how you went in a flow because it, it just comes like a waterfall. Two things that I absolutely love from what you said. One is, you know, again, I cannot emphasize this enough that it's important for you to even advertise your organic content. You put money on it because you wanted to promote it in front of those 50 accounts. It's it's pretty much like, you know, account-based marketing, uh, pretty much. It's like targeting those specific people and showing your content right there. Uh, let's not put a name on it, but that's what it is. And then the second aspect, what I love is, you know, where you said that there are certain companies that are going out and the, uh, just sharing the content from their organization, which is, and when the leader does it, it's like, you're just a billboard, you know, it, it is not anything more than that. And trust me, there have been certain organizations in the recent past when, you know, uh, that got in touch with me. And one of the key priorities as part of their work with SAS Prince was that they said, hey, can you, um, uh, you know, take charge of our CEO's uh, LinkedIn and post on a daily basis. And I'm like, dude, the point of view needs to come from there. You know, if I start posting on that behalf and I'm posting generic content, and if it's not the direction that the organization wants to go in, it definitely does not make sense. And there are very, very few people who understand those perspectives and are saying that, okay, now I have this. Once you have those things sorted as to what to say and who is it for, Promotion is pretty much second nature. You know, you know where to post, what is the format and all of those things. And uh, I mean, I'm so happy that you emphasized on each of these pillars very, very clearly. Yeah, th there is one thing that I want to mention because you mentioned media company and it didn't address that uh, yeah. rightfully. What I see happening in the next year or two uh, is actually the content becoming, uh, you know, more of an entertainment. And we, we see people from, from B2B as, uh, you know, as skaters uh, and as those kind of things. You know, if you watch any documentary that skaters create, it's amazing. You know, the intro, how it goes, everything. I see that going also exploding on YouTube because like on social, it appears that, you know, those 30 seconds up to a minute videos, they're okay. People consume that and you can be successful with that. But do they drive the long-term results? I don't think so. Right. So from that perspective, I see something else happening. And when you look at that, like entertaining high level content, not many companies can perform that. Right. So it will be the differentiation uh, for, from that perspective. And also one, uh, one more thing I wanted to, to, to mention, and I think it's important for that conversation. The one of the biggest stoppers inside the company that why don't you create the quality content, why you are not persistent and why you don't post at all. Sometimes it's because you have at least 10 eyeballs on each piece of content all the time before you actually show it, show it to the customers, right? Because uh, it happens 
a lot. If you have a domain, a company that grew from 300 to 850 people in three months, but in two months, we were not able to ship anything. You know, even the, the, the girl who was uh, the middleman between me, the, the CMO and the content team, even she had opinion about the content. Right. So, uh, and, and what I usually say for the marketing, it's not that, you know, and going back to the beginning of our conversation, everybody thinks that they know marketing, you know, you need to sometimes risk and go through it, ask for opinions. Okay. But you need to be the one who is making the decision if it's going to go or not. And usually you know how it will perform and you motivate the team by selling to those people inside the company first. And when it's happening inside the company, then when you go to the social, then basically they say that we created this piece of content, this research, we did spend three months doing it. It's so amazing. I'm going to post it on my own, no matter what they told me or no, or what they don't told me, right? So from that perspective, we need to fix the things inside the companies and who decides what. And, you know, that's what makes marketing vanilla because it's not important what I'm thinking what the CMO thinks, what the content team thinks, what founders thinks. It's important what the customers say. And we cannot know that until we post like at least five different pieces of content and see which one sticks uh, and how do, what's the feedback that we are getting and in which direction we should go and optimize forward. Absolutely. You know, this, this gives me uh, memories of so many incidents over the years, but absolutely, you know, this is amazing. Right. So that brings us to the next half of the podcast, which we call the rapid fire section. Here, I'm going to be shooting five pointed questions at you. The questions may be short, but the answers may not be. Let's go with the flow, whatever comes to your mind. Are you ready? Yeah, let's go. All right. Here's question number one. What is one virtue or value that you would advise every single marketer that you come across pretty much in the early stages to imbibe? Creativity, uh, curiosity, sorry, curiosity, which actually relates to the lifelong learning and everything. You need to be curious to find out all the things what's happening inside the company with the customers, with everything, and to be curious enough to find the solutions and then implement them. So I think curiosity is, is for me one of the things I don't see that many marketers are curious and, you know, curiosity gets you closer to the, to the money, you know, how the money goes inside the company. And, and as you get closer to that, you become a better marketer. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is one quality that is required for all GTM folks, not only marketing, sales, customer success, right. pretty much everyone. Love it. Right. Here's question number two. In one of your uh, recent LinkedIn posts, which I absolutely loved, you said uh, all performance marketing is about revenue. All branding is about profitability. I would love if you can expand on it a little more. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, it is actually the comment from uh, from Rich Paul that I, that I saw. Uh, and uh, and basically, it's it's kind of goes like, you know, brand profitability and, and revenue uh, and growth. It, you know, from, from that perspective. And I think people, uh, you know, think from the short-term perspective a lot of time, like everything is a part of the growth. It is. But if you think that only performance brings the growth, then you will do only performance and actually only go and create short-term, you know, and from that perspective, okay, short-term will work. You will get the revenue, but do you track how many people actually, uh, you know, stop using your product? Do you understand how many, how much people are, you know, how much the average deal, how much the, the cost, uh, you know, customer acquisition cost from that perspective. If you don't put the brand part, those things will increase, you know, like, uh, I mean, customer acquisition costs will increase. The people, uh, you know, spending time using your product will decrease from that side and people won't stay much longer uh, with you and using your product. So uh, I look at those things from the lens of like sales is there to uh, to kind of spark the growth. Marketing is there to accelerate the growth and take it to the next level. Because, uh, you know, because marketing is one to many, usually sales is one to one and it's easy to sell and spark the growth when you go and talk with each, uh, you know, target customer and try to convert some of them. 
but then you see what's happening with all of them. You know, what is the problem? What's their perspective? And then you apply that into the marketing and it takes everything to the to the higher level. And when you have, you know, the the brand, basically you need to invest a, a lot less money into the, you know, into the performance. You have people coming to you directly. You have people talking about you. You have word of mouth growing and the costs are lower and it goes directly to profitability. You always look at certain companies and you feel that I wish I had that brand, but you know, we often don't realize that how much of peddling they've done under the waters over the years to get where they are. And that's, this is what exactly it contributes to. I, I mean, that. I mean, one more perspective is if you look at the, we mentioned MQLs. So like the MQL cap is the person that, you know, you just interested in education. Uh, and when that's the goal for the marketing, they get as many MQLs as possible. So they go to sales yeah. and say, try to talk to them and realize, you know, they are shit. They don't want to talk with you. Because they are not ready, you know, send them back. So, uh, and basically to be able to, for sales to talk to all those people, you need a lot more people in sales because marketing is getting more and more MQLs. And when yeah. you have a lot more of them, not everybody are good. So you need to invest a lot more into the sales team, into, uh, you know, educating them. If you're getting that, because B2B companies are sales companies and they understand sales. So uh, if it's a different way, then when you reach out, somebody from, from sales reach out to the people, they know who they are. If the brand is already there, they, they know the name of the company, if, if not their name as well. So uh, it makes their job easier as well. So you don't need, you know, like, 50 people or 15 people in, in sales, you need just two who are experienced to close, you know, the demand that marketing is creating and go ahead and have time to actually do the outbound, which is easier if the brand is already there. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, every time I hear you, one thing that I cannot help feel is that looks like we've almost worked with the same set of people all the time because the experiences are very, very similar. Love. Yeah, it's it's in the whole, in the whole industry. That's how it goes. <laughs> right, right. Right. So here's um, question number three. If I'm not wrong, I think you prioritize content creation over content consumption. I want to understand. I'm a little curious about why that order. Why do you put creation before consumption? So what's the thought process behind that? Yeah. Uh, basically, if you if you don't create content, you just consume content. You become one of those people that buys every course, buys uh, you know every ebook buys everything, reads everything, think that they know everything, but never executes, never implements, right? And, and you become, uh, a, you know, a lifelong learner without results. Basically, it doesn't lead to, to any results. What I like to do is, sure, you consume content, but up to the level that it gets you somewhere where you want to go. So to give you an example, when I started Funky Marketing, I, I got out of, all the Facebook communities, I was a member of like 50 of them, uh, talking about B2C marketing, about B2B, about performance, about those kind of things, automation, lead generation. And I saw like, okay, there are three people, they're, they're my North Star, they're moving in the same direction or they're already there when I want to go. So I said, I'm gonna follow only these three people and what they consume, what they listen, because I want to be there as well. And it's, uh, you know, it's, helped me so much that basically when I just started talking about those things, you, you know, how it is, you first get educated, then you start copy, because you start producing, and then you find out, aha, this is my specifics and I can talk better if I talk, uh, you know, from this standpoint. And then, then you find your own voice. But the thing is, if you don't do all those things, you will never find your voice. So it is first, the, the, you know, consume the content, then you start Try to copy what others are doing, what they are telling you, see if it works for your target group or no. Then you see, aha, something is work, some doesn't. So I can go with those things that work and maybe add a few things over my own. And then you become, you know, let's call it an expert or professional in what you are doing. Without that, you basically become somebody who is just consuming content. Because you can spend hours on LinkedIn reading. You can spend hours, you know, um, listening to the podcast. Doom scrolling. <laughs> Exactly. And it doesn't get you anything. It's, you're just wasting your time. Uh, I mean, the same thing can go, you know, you can spend your time playing the mobile mobile game, right? J just, you know, Tetris. It's the same thing. 
No, this is so good because immediately at least five, six names come to my head in my immediate circle uh, who primarily does sign up for every single course and uh, have never put out a piece of content in the longest time I remember. Absolutely, right? So if, if you don't put out something and try and experiment, you're never really going to learn. Otherwise, everything becomes knowledge or a database that you have, which is not helpful for anyone. Love it. Right. So question number four, what is one thing that you want to learn when it comes to content marketing? What is that you think you've not still gained expertise on? Oh, that's, that's the question that uh, you, you sent me the question and I was like, uh, no idea. So <laughs> let, let's go into the thought process. So uh, what, what, one thing that I want to learn and to do much better is definitely uh, customer research and getting better into, into that thing. I see a lot of people asking me questions about AI, about going into that direction. And I'm like, I'm going to go to the foundation and to backwards and kind of strengthen my foundation uh, even more, right? Because uh, and when I look and all the things like now on the Serbia market, I, I don't talk about global now. People here recognize, aha, he is the one who, oh, yeah, B2B marketing is Nemanja, right? But uh, I actually told them I'm not the one who, who knows everything. I was just at the right time, at the right place when cast with the way B2B buyers buy his change. And I recognize that and it gave me a lot of leverage, but I still have a lot of things to do and I want to fill it out with, uh, with learning more about, about the foundation. Yeah. You know, so from that point, uh, I've enrolled in, in some courses and talk more with the customers, try to implement that. And see, you know, which questions to ask whom, uh, you know, when, why those questions exactly, and, and to extract more from the customers. You know, you can go with a couple of easy questions. I've been doing it for a, for a lot of years, and, and you get some of the things. But when you when you want to go uh, out the market and talk uh, and work with bigger companies, you need to dig more deeper. And I need, uh, you know, a lot more knowledge to be able to dig deeper than that. Right. Um, so here's the final rapid fire question. What is that one metric that you would highly recommend every content marketer to measure? And what is one metric that you would, you know, tell people that don't use this metric? Yeah, now, now that's kind of, kind of interesting because I wouldn't tie it necessarily to the content marketing. Okay. But, but to the marketing in general, it is the one that, uh, you know, I'll be looking at, what can we measure? Because there's a lot of uh, talk all around about, uh, you know, about the metrics. So it, it should it be pipeline? Should it be revenue? Should it be something else? And, and I kind of like what uh, Chris Walker and Refine Labs came up with uh, at the Hero Pipeline, H-I-N-R-O. Uh, so basically leads that come through a high dent source. It can be book a call, schedule a demo, or, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is, between rates greater than, greater than 3% from lead to bid, and basically reach a deal in stage in your pipeline that converts a 25% rate for that cohort of opportunities. And I see that, and I love that metric because it shows, are we bringing the right customers in, right? It's, it's a long-term metric that actually says, are we doing the right thing from the sales perspective, from the marketing perspective, and from everything, partnerships also from the everything that we do, right? If the right people come in and that metrics keep growing, uh, then we know that we are on the right track. If not, there are a lot of things that we need to fix. But I told you like the metrics, metric is one thing that we need to optimize for. And when we optimize for uh, the one that I wouldn't recommend, it's, you know, MQLs as people who downloaded your ebook, or people who have watched your webinar. Those are people, or even I, I saw that, especially working in a dark market, you know, people who have uh, come to your website a few times. You know, it's not merely close to people saying, I want to talk to the sales or I want to buy. So I want to optimize everything to uh, get the people come to the website and say, I want to buy or I want to buy. And then when we look at the hero pipeline, Basically, we see if those are the right people that are coming or no, and then we optimize our efforts based on that. Love it. You know, it, it takes me to the memories of uh, in the early days of Avoma when I first asked um, Aditya, the CEO there, uh, as to what is 
the one metric that you want me to uh, prioritize on or what what is the quick win that you want me to focus on he said let's do good marketing let's make sure that you know in the in- initial stages uh, we have a small um, set that we are working towards which is our customers prospects and audience so let's make sure that we offer the best experiences at every touch point and not burn bridges so that to me was very very unique and uh, i've never heard any ceo say that in my past and um, you know that grew so much of respect for somebody who really understands what the market needs and not just goes by certain numbers exactly i mean look that that's greatly said because marketing has one job and to it that's reverse engineering the buying process and get just enough in each stage so uh, the customers uh, until the customer is ready and they come to convert and I usually like to tie marketing to the to the conversion on a website because it tells us basically what's happening right if they come from other sources okay we can track that we can we can measure that but it actually tells us what's happening all right, so uh, that brings us towards the end of the episode. But before I give you my thank yous, I would like to ask you one thing. For all the listeners who are here who want to connect with you, what is the best place that you prefer to be connected with? Yeah, I mean, the best place is, is LinkedIn, definitely. Then, I mean, I'm all around. So Instagram, Twitter, whatever. If they want to talk with me about basketball and music, then it's Twitter probably. <laughs> but uh, also uh, Funky Marketing Podcast. On, on YouTube or on any platform, uh, started posting again last week. So a lot of interesting guests coming and a lot of interesting content when we dive deep into the exactly the strategies and the tactics that you need to kind of implement. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's it. Just ping me on any platform, said that you're listening to uh, this episode with Yark and you find out a lot of, uh, you know, send me some specifics that you heard and you know uh that's how i will be able to share it and we can get more listeners to the to the x podcast yeah absolutely and uh you know for all the listeners here i can definitely tell you that my conversation with nemania started probably about three four years ago uh just over a virtual coffee probably during the or just pre-covid times and uh from there uh we went on to build a beautiful relationship i can definitely vouch that he's one person who genuinely cares and will uh, share his insights and he's genuinely helpful and wants an ecosystem around him. So um, thank you so much, Nemanja, uh, for being here. And is there a parting message that you would like to share with our audience today? I always say to the people, keep it funky. And there is one thing that it means, and I want to use the opportunity to explain. And it is, you know, the definition of art music is growth that makes you want to move. So basically it means that Funky marketing, if you add a little funk, it means not only, you know, be visible to your target audience, but do enough to activate them so they come to you and buy when they're ready. So that's my last message. Wow, I love it. I, you know, every time I saw uh, Let's Make It Funky, I never realized the depth to that. I think that's that's really nice message to close this episode. And thank you so much, Nemanja. I absolutely appreciate. I did not even feel like, you know, we crossed an hour uh, discussing today. Really appreciate your time joining us. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure.